Welcome everybody to the Reed Memorial Sunday School class, uh, especially those of you who are watching uh, this on video. Uh, we thank you for joining us. I've got a, I've got a solid group of uh, Christians here to discuss, continue our series, the titles of Jesus, and this one we're going to be exploring the Son of Man. Um, just a quick review. Uh, on the first week, we, uh, Sanford led us in an exploration of Jesus as prophet. And Jesus never, never claimed to be a prophet, um, and yet there are certain things about the, uh, about the prophet uh, predicted in, in Judaism that cer certainly point to Jesus and his ministry, and there is some applicability to that. Uh, following that, I think I did, a, I did a, one on the suffering servant of Yahweh. Um, and uh, that, of course, that was one that Jesus is found throughout the New, New Testament. Um, and, uh, you know, it's not one that Jesus ever used about himself, but it, he certainly borrowed from that a lot in his self-description of himself and, uh, and others. Uh, and then uh, Sanford led us on Messiah and High Priest. Uh, again, designations that are certainly used of Jesus, um, but not uh, by Jesus. But now it's going to change. Now we've got a title. This is the one Jesus used about himself more than any other title, uh, which ought to get our attention as one that's worthy of study. It's not the one that tradition picked up as the one to designate Christ. That tended to be Messiah, Christ, which is the same as Messiah. Um, but this is the one that Jesus uh, mentions himself uh, the most. So let's talk a little bit about this term um, for the, uh, the, the, the son of man. So uh, son of man is, uh, is from uh, Greek, uh, we, we us to anthropo. Uh, you probably know the word anthropos. Anthropos means, you know, a human being. So it means something like the son of a human being. You know, that's, that's but basically what it means, or son of man. So very, very literal. Uh, the Hebrew uh, is bar Adam, uh, bar Adam, son of Adam. Jerry, I think of you, I like Aslan always calls the children in Narnia, sons of Adam's, daughters of Eve, right? So that, in some sense, he's calling them son of man. This is man, Adam's, the same thing in Hebrew, right? And, um, and then, of course, in between both of these, there's the Aramaic bar nashah. And bar nashah, in, in Aramaic, uh, bar can be a, an intensifier. Uh, so if you, if you called somebody, this is per culmin, if you called somebody the son of the lie, that, mean, that's, that, would, that means they're a liar. If you call them a son of wealth, that means they're rich. And if you call somebody a son of man, that means they're really, really, really a human being. Which is uh, which is interesting, right? And and uh, and there's some case to be made that the, that the appropriate uh, translation into Greek under that under if we restrictly the way it's used in Aramaic, Barnasha, would be just human. You know, just human, right? So I'll keep that in the backdrop of what you're talking about. Now the Greek differs from the Hebrew and the Aramaic in the sense that it. One, it adds the definite article, the. So when you see the Son of Man, this is only in the New Testament that we'll find this usage. You'll find usages in the Old Testament, but none of those have a definite article. It's just Son of Man or a Son of Man or like a Son of Man, speaking to a Son of Man. So, uh, so for instance, in the, in the book of Ezekiel, um, Ezekiel's the prophet himself is referred to as son of man 93 times. I, I still think of the term son of man, can you make these bones live? Mm -hmm. And it's really like human. Let me tell you something. Human, are you paying attention? Human, right, to distinguish them from God. Um, so the, the other thing it loses as we move out of Hebrew into Greek is this etymological reference to Adam. You know, in Hebrew, in, in Hebrew uh, Adam is, and, and, uh, is the same as man, and for the, the title, the name of this first human, Adam. And it's, 
something I want to bring us back around to towards the end of this discussion as we think about uh, Jesus, who just identifies himself as the bar Adam, as the son of Adam, and think about what that means. That's kind of where the name comes from. And as far as I could discern, there's about maybe four different uses of this in the New Testament. I'm, I'm not even, I mean shaky, whether you can number these or not, but roughly to categorize these things. Uh, one is for its earthly work and its humble condition that the humanity is emphasized in this use of the Son of Man. Okay? The second is this, this connection that Jesus makes between the title Son of Man and his suffering, death, and resurrection. Um, and the third is what seems to be a reference back to the book of Daniel. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, third, I, I picked this up on one verse as a kind of mediator between man and God. This is where the angels are ascending and descending. And the fourth is, is in his is retur heavenly return. This is going back to a usage in the book of Daniel about an eschatological figure, an end time figure called the son of man. And, and all four of those uses show up in the New Testament. And so I was going to deal with some scriptures as we go through these things and look at them, beginning with this one, the one that emphasizes his humanity. And we've mentioned the etymology of it, and you know, Barnasha and Aramaic is just strictly a human being. So this is, um, in some sense, talking about his humanity. And uh, even some of these are a little bit hard to categorize. Um, the, the first one, I mean, is, is semi-demand, but uh, divine. But I do want to uh, emphasize it in Mark two. Um, this is when the this is when the people drop the paralyzed man in, you know, from the roof and lay them down among the monk, amongst of them, and, and they, they beg him to forgive the sins. And he says, well, uh, he, he, the, some teachers of the law get a little upset when he says, you know, he's going to forgive his sins. Um, and then Jesus says, well, I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take, your, take up your mat, and go home. Uh, whether that fits under this designation of the idea of a human being, but this is Jesus among the others, healing, curing, right? Healing, you remember in the um, in 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 this context is a very is a very physical, intimate act. It's not done at a distance, right? It's done in a very earthly way, and Jesus often. Uh, these things are often put together in the gospel in which the forgiveness of sins and healing are put together in, in, in this particular way. Um, in Matthew 11, uh, this is uh, verse 16 through 19. This is, uh, this is with Jesus, to what can I compare this generation? And th this is why do you, you know, why do you hang out with tax collectors and drunkards and wh why are you doing stuff like this? And he, Contrast, it's like, well, you give John issues because he's out there by himself eating the wild locusts and honey. And he, he says, uh, he says, the, the son of man came eating and drinking. And they say, here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved right by her deeds. So this is an idea of Jesus that's just among the, among the people eating and drinking, he, even somewhat immoderately just like any any other human would eat right when you're at a feast you eat, eat a little bit more i'm going to eat more at thanksgiving than i do on a normal day right um and this is this is the son of man here is is you know just like like any other human being i eating and eating eating and drinking you know this prophet who stands apart is not but this, i am and the last one along these lines is Matthew 8. Um, uh, a teacher of the law came to him and says, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus says, Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Uh, this is his, his I guess, his, his, his poverty, his la lack of one place, his itinerant mission, his... Um, that if you're going to follow me, be prepared to be very uncomfortable uh, in your daily day-to-day -day life. 
because uh, it's a it's a hard life for a man, right? Something like that. Thoughts on these on this collection of verses? Any anything stand out to you on those? I'm not even sure I've categorized the first one on forgiveness of sins, but it's something. It certainly, it will come come later about the idea of the Son of Man as a as a judge and whether those two are related, and also whether forgiveness of sins relates to the suffering servant aspect as well. It could fit in any, any, any three of those. I, I would also say forgiveness of sins could fit in that other category, the one about mediator between God and man, right? Where it's like, this is the, this is the sign of God is when you're a for, forgiver of sins. Yeah, Jerry. Uh, that passage, uh, with the uh, paralytic being dropped down through the roof. Uh, it just always fascinated me that uh, he looked at this man, uh, but he, and he calls himself the son of man, and he wants to prove the son of man has power to forgive sins, which to me is equa equating himself with God because they've just said, who do you think he is? Only God can forgive sins. Uh, so, so he's identifying uh, calling himself son of man or human being, but at the same time, calling himself God. Uh, I, I just think it's a, uh, that's a phenomenal story. It looks at this man who's paralyzed or whatever's wrong with him. And, and the first thing he said to him is your sins are forgiven. Yeah. And we see his four friends that brought him and tore up the roof to get him there. These four friends looking down through the roof are saying, hey, hey Jesus, we didn't come here to get his sins worked on. We we brought him here to get his legs fixed. And, that's, yeah. uh, and Jesus saw what, what he really needed. That he needed a relationship with God and had to get his sins out of the way for that to happen. Well, it's also interesting in that passage, which um, always haunted me, is it's not because because Jesus saw his faith, the faith of the paralytic, it's because he saw their faith, the faith of the friends. Yeah, that he saves their sins. And I don't know how to put that together, but it's uh, don't either. It's 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 wonderful in some ways, right? You know, what 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 they what the friends do for this do for this man more than more than they accounted for, right? Super healer, Jesus. And it tells us we have the power that, in doing the same kind of thing to change somebody's life. Uh, Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, Jerry. All right, well, let's move on a little bit. Um, so the, the next collection, this goes back to the talk I gave a few weeks ago on the, on the suffering servant of Yahweh. Um, because Jesus makes this connection between son of man and these stories in Isaiah about the, suffer, about the servant of God. Um, and that, that's peculiar to Jesus, but, um, so I give, I, I think I'm just going to deal with the one in, um, for, for right now in Mark eight, um, Mark eight, starting at verse 31, it says, uh, he then began to teach them. And this is after Peter's, where Peter says, you are the Messiah, son of the living God. This is right on the heels of that. We dealt with this scripture every single time, I think. Um, he then began to teach them that the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law. And then he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke, he spoke plainly about this and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. And we have talked, we talked before about the nature of that rebuke. Um, we talk, I think we talked last week about the nature of that rebuke. So I'm going to skip ahead to verse 38. He says, if anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the son of man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his father's glory with the holy angels. So the first part of this, this is about suffer, the son of man must suffer many things. Well, that refers to this suffering servant figure that we talked about a few weeks ago. And this last part refers to what we're going to deal with in a little bit, referring to this figure from Daniel chapter 7. 
of the eschatological son of man who's going to be the judge in the end times. Um, but he, he's put that together. I've got a little passage from Oscar Coleman to just emphasize this. He says, both the suffering servant and the son of man already existed in Judaism. But Jesus' combination of precisely these two titles was something completely new. Son of Man represents the highest conceivable declaration of exaltation in Judaism. Ebed Yahweh, the, the, the servant of Yahweh, is the expression of the deepest humiliation. Even if there really was a concept of a suffering Messiah in Judaism, it cannot be proved that the suffering was combined precisely with the idea of the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. This is the unheard of new act of Jesus, that he united these two apparently contradictory tasks in his self-consciousness, and that he expressed that union in his life and teaching. So as we get to this business of the, of the Son of Man who's coming in the clouds to judge, you know, judge all humanity in the end times, and connect it with this figure of the one who just gives his life as a ransom for many, it's worth putting it together. That is completely novel to Jesus. There is nothing, there's nothing prior to Jesus that could have prepared us for this identification. And yet, almost always where he uses this thing about himself, it's, he's, he's, there's some connection back to that. Comments on that, questions about that? You know, so much of the, or the scriptures we could have talked about, we talked about a few weeks ago, we dealt, dealt with uh, Servant of Yahweh. I was reading Son of Man over and over again in that. Nothing? Why well, wasn't it Elijah who referred to himself as Son of Man? Yeah, again, again Son of Man, was in, you know, in, in, the, in the Old Testament, typically was, was just a, meant a human being. Right, I'm just a human being. You know, I'm I'm born from men. Gonna, gonna, you know that that's what that's what it meant. And and, you know, one one wonders whether you know, Son of Man is also something that, for Christ, emphasized his incarnational reality as being a human being. I just I wonder uh, when when if Jesus is it's almost calling himself that name it's like he's trying to emphasize his humanness uh you know the the 19 creed idea of the very man very god uh that he's he's called himself this to emphasize his humanness and yet the thing that we struggle with more is his deity not his humanness uh and i always kind of been troubled by that. I wish he had referred to himself as deity a little bit more than, than his humanness. So uh, my friends that have a problem with Jesus, they just, they can't believe that he's deity. They can say he's a good person. And it's like the Muslims. Yeah. I, I, well, I think it depends on who you're talking to, Jerry. I think, I think, I think people outside the faith have, are, 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 are like you, you saying, what they have problems with is Jesus as a deity. No problems with Jesus as a human being. But I think, I think most Christians, it's the other way around. I, I think we tend to struggle with him thinking him as a human being like us. Like us in every way. You know, that, that um, you know, greater things will, will you do, you know? Um, that there's something in Jesus' mess, me, mission that's not that's that's translatable into human terms. Um, I mean, part of it is this the suffering servant idea from a few weeks ago. Um, that's translated translatable in human terms. But when the Jews would have heard "Son of Man," in this case, they would have thought of a divine figure. We haven't gotten to that yet. But to them, that was that was more of the of the airy deity type idea um but you're i mean you're right i mean it's it's a scandal either way it's a difficult thing this is why the 
the church fa- fathers, especially at Chalcedon, had to work, you know, work so hard to try to really nail down this theology about Jesus being fully human and fully God. You know, have, having one person with two natures. And it, it, it took hundreds of years to really hammer that out and understand that. And a lot of heretical movements that were trying to pick one side or the other. Um, and yet Jesus relates the human and the divine so intimately, like there, there's to the extent that there can be a confusion one with the other. I tend to think that the, the, the heroes in Jesus' time, when he used this, that they would hear it, the, particularly the Jews, would hear it different than, than we hear it today. That, uh, like when he said, when he healed a paralytic, he says to show you that the Son of Man has power to forgive sins, that they would have, you know, that Son of Man title would have been, wow, and, you know, where we kind of, in a sense, gloss over it uh, and think it's, it's not too, such an important title, but I think it, uh, we, we don't know, we don't understand it the way that the Jews did. Yeah. It, well, it's really hard, and, and Jesus' use of it was mostly really novel, especially in these texts I just read, you know, the one the, in the Mark, you know, the, the, the triumvirate, Mark 8, 9, Mark 8, Mark 9, Mark, Mark 10, where he, he's connecting Messiah with Son of Man, suffering servant with Son of Man, that, that the, all, the, this, these, these titles getting mixed together, they weren't necessarily mixed together in Judaism. Um, and yet Jesus becomes the fulfillment of all of them. Um, but as Sanford mentioned last week, there's a value in going through these things kind of one at a time, because each of them, like the, like Sanford's idea, the, what he talked about, the blind man and the elephant, the blind men and the elephant and seeing different aspects of it. And then one, no one of these titles does Jesus full justice. Um, but Jesus has loaded this one up with a lot. Again, the, the, his earthly incarnation is here, his idea as a mediator. And, uh, and I, I'm going to talk later on about the, uh, as an image, of, an image of God, humankind is the image of God, you know, an, another, this eschatological Adam and then, and this suffering servant of Yahweh. He's, he's combining all of that into this one title, but that is a, that's novel to Jesus. Um, okay. Um, and then there's this one peculiar verse, uh, one, one little chapter. This is in John chapter one. I, I didn't know where to place it, so I just made up a, I made up its own little. I gave it its own little place. I said it as mediator of of, of God and man. He says, uh, he says, Jesus, you believe. Uh, Jesus says, in the Saint Daniel, you believe because I told you under the fig tree, uh, you'll see greater things than that. And then added, very, very truly, I tell you. You will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Uh, clearly, a, a reference back to, you know, to the to the uh, to, to the book of, of Genesis, right? Um, and, uh, and and Israel himself, right? <laughs> and uh, and Jacob Jacob's ladder, seeing the seeing the the, the a, a ladder reaching up to heaven with the angels going up and down. And, in a, in a dream of Jacob, um, some, something about this. I, I don't know how this speaks to you. To me, I hear, you know, that that it's that Jesus, being the revelation of God, is now the mediator of God. It's the way God speaks to us through this thing. That the that the lines of communic angels are messengers, right? And the lines of communication are all invested in this person now but I, how do you hear it how do you hear the angels of god ascending and descending on the son of man i get i get the sense of uh jesus giving an image of uh the ultimate highway between heaven and earth the heavens are open and we'll see that this son of man this person, Jesus, um, 
made it possible for us to to get to God and, and even see the angels coming and going. It's going to be just unbelievable. And uh, anyway, I just see that, like you said, as a mediator, uh, but being the mediator and also being the highway, also being the ladder, everything. He is going to be the connector between us and God. Yeah, Sanford. Uh, I, I find this idea fascinating in John. And a little bit later in the third chapter, he says, Jesus says, no one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the son of man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the son of man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. And I find it fascinating because the very next verse is the one that most people know better than any other verse. For God so loved the world. <laughs> so yeah. it, again, Jesus is taking these concepts that existed and he is redefining them in himself and combining them in himself in such a way that <laughs> it just is remarkable. Yeah, I think about the uh, the opening to the book of Hebrews, where he said, you know, uh, where the, the author writes, in the past, God spoke to our ancestor through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he also made the universe. Um, the son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. Yeah. And, and I, I think about that, that opening as I, and I think what you're going to teach us coming up, uh, Sanford on, on Jesus as the word of God the also Lord. relates to this idea. Mm -hmm. Next the comes image. the Lord, yeah, but then ultimately the word. Yeah. Yeah. The word, right. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, there's, there's a lot in that image. <laughs> Uh, a lot we can unpack, but uh, I think I'll move on a little bit, and we'll look at this this last one. And um, and this is where it, these are these are verses talking about his future coming in, in heavenly glory to act with sovereign power at a final judgment. Um. So the reference is to Daniel seven. I'm just going to read th these few verses, thirteen and fourteen. He says, as I watched in the night visions, I saw one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. And he came to the ancient one and was presented before him. To him was given dominion and glory and kingship that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that shall not pass away. And his kingship is one that shall never be destroyed. Um, and there's one way of reading this. It's, it's, it's you know, I saw, I, I saw a human being being given this stuff. In other words, a, a God's going to, going, going to um, confer this dominion on a human being. Um, and and it, it, it's just emphasizing that human aspect of it. But, of course, the tradition of Judaism took this as an eschatological figure and sometimes connected to the Messiah, sometimes, sometimes uh, you know, God himself. Um, but this, is, this, this passage in Daniel 7 is, I think, the usual, like, you know, Jerry, you made that gesture, you know, that almost divine notion of, 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 a, a, of a divine, of a semi-divine figure here uh, that's going to rule over the end times. Um, and so I, I, I think I've sent you several passages, but I, I, I want to just concentrate on the one, Matthew 25. Um, and look at that one. So if Matthew 25, uh, starting at verse 31, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne all the nations will be gathered before him, 
Okay, so that now we've already now just that part. We this is the Daniel figure, the one who's been seated on a throne, being given all dominion. You know, at the right hand of God. Right. This is that figure. Uh, he says, and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to the, those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father. Take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. Um, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed, clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go visit you? Like you, I, when did we do all this for you? I don't remember that. You know? And the king will reply, truly, I say, whatever you did for the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he'll say to those on the left, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? You were proud. Truly, I tell you, whatever you did not do for the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Um, <clears throat> And I, I want to hit. I want to actually want to hit another passage. This was. This one is in. Um, is in John chapter five. I don't know if this was. This, did it end up your notes? There are some I added after the fact. I think this one is. Um, sure. Yeah, and um, Jesus. Jesus goes in this whole thing about you know his relationship between himself and his father and how he. He's completely subordinate to the father. He only does what the father does. The father is invested in him certain things. And he says, I'm going to start at verse uh, 24. He says, very truly, I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him uh, who, who sent me has eternal life, believes him who sent me has eternal life. And he will not be judged, but is crossed over from death to life. Very truly, I tell you, a time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who, who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so has he granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to judge because he is the Son of Man, which is interesting, right? Not because he's the Son of God, because he's the Son of Man. Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done what is good will rise to life, and, and those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. By myself, I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just. For I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. And here we get a little bit of a different spin on the judge of man, but we still get the judge of the man who's coming, uh, who is who is going to uh, judge the, you know, judge who's who's saved and who's condemned, di divide the two. Uh, yeah, Jim. Yeah, but don't you love verse twenty-seven where it it says, "I can judge you properly because I have, as the son of man, I have experienced." What you go, what you are like as a human being, uh, it it makes it more empathetic for the judgment for for us as humans. It's a little different, right? It's a little more down to earth here in the in this John five chapter rather than the Matthew twenty five chapter that we just read. There we get more closely the uh, almost a almost a, a, a son in heaven. These are the you always see these in these altar altarpiece paintings, you know of the 
you know, like in uh, this, like in the Sistine Chapel, this Michelangelo worked for seven years on the Last Judgment, you know, with a big Christ in the center, the damned, damned below and to the left, and the and the righteous on the right and rising. Right, that's this big heaven, almost a heavenly figure, and this one in John seems more human. But of course, we know both sides of that are true. Right. And it's the same going back to the paralytic, healing the paralytic. So you'll know that the Son of Man has the power to forgive sins. So we've got the judging and forgiving sins is, are very related, right? <laughs> like who's going to be forgiven? Any other, other, other comments on this? I think it's just, <clears throat> it's, it's the, both of these passages are, are just powerful commentaries on or in opposition to universalism but, uh, jesus in his own words makes it to me makes it very clear <clears throat> there's going to be an ultimate separation that it, it, it's uh it's not just going to pan out for everybody yeah I, it, it it seems to <laughs> you know, it, it, it seems to, it, 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 it does seem like there, there, there's, there's going to be this sifting. Um, you get this, you get the images in revelation too, you know, of the, here, here you get this, here you get the son of man on high and he's sending out the angels with their, their sickles, right? This is where you get the, the grapes of wrath and the whole business, right? It, and, uh, and separating the wheat from the chaff. Uh, you get those, those images in Revelation. Um, and it's, uh, and, and I, I, I think that's exactly the sense you get. I, but I think the challenge to us is, is to connect it as Jesus does to the suffering servant of Yahweh. And what if judgment looks like that? What if the avenging judge looks like Jesus crucified? Then what's our image? And how do, how do we connect these things? You know, is, 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 that, is that the moment of, just, of, of judgment in a way? Um, I, I think that's the challenge. It's, it, 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 it's, it, there's, a, there's this divine judge and there's this human in obedience who suffers for others and and how how do the two connect that's the challenge and i i think it's the challenge for us too uh, like how how are we how are we going to be sons of men you know, um, and I sort of wanted to talk a little bit more about the business of son of man. Also, there's a connection Coleman makes, and I think it's right. Uh, connecting son of man to this idea of a human being as an image bearer. As someone who has got the image and likeness of God. Right. I mean, that's what a son of is as well. The son is the image of the father. Um, anybody who's seen me and my father next to each other will have no doubt <laughs> that we have come, that we are we, we, I, who I, who I it was parented by. It was not the milkman. There's no question about who my father is because <laughs> I, I, I am his very image. Woody. Yeah, Jane. It's the same with Jed. Yeah. Bless his heart, Every, when he went to high school, the principal looked at him and said, well, I can tell who you are. And I was chairman of the school board at that time, and he said, don't think you can get away with anything. <laughs> <laughs> he still holds the record for the most Saturday schools. <laughs> uh. <laughs> So yeah, I wanna I wanna look at Genesis one, 
Uh, so Genesis 1, starting at verse 26. I don't know if that was on your notes or not. Some of these things got cobbled. Yeah. It is. It is. It yeah. is. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And, um, and here we know this isn't just about Jesus, right? This is about anybody, human being, mm -hmm. has been, um, presumably, has inherited the image of God from Adam. That in, in that sense, we are, we are bar Adam. We are, we are sons of Adam, daughters of Eve. And that we are image bearers. Or we're meant to be image bearers. Let's put it that way. We were meant to be image bearers of God. Um, and of course, Jesus himself is the image bearer par excellence. You know, the image of the, in, the invisible God, as Paul says in Colossians, right? Um, and the question is, if, if, if Son of Man has anything to do with image bearing, I, I just think that there's a lot of fruit for us as we think about how we ought to live. I, it would be a shame to go through talking about Jesus without understanding what, what because of who Jesus is, how ought we to be? What the Son of Man image might mean for us as, <clears throat> as bearers have, of the image of God. Have this mind in you that also was the mind of Christ. That, you know, it's, it's, that to me is a lot more than just, you know, what do you look like? What shirt are you going to put on today? have this mind in you that is the mind of Christ. Uh, in other passages, you know, we're, we're to become, uh, Lewis says, it, we're, we're to become little Christ. That's our, that's our ultimate goal. That's what God intended us to be, is little Christ. Yeah, little, or little sons of men, you know? It's like... Um, um, There's something about the idea, you know, um, about how do we how do we do that? How do we live that? And what does it mean to be an image bearer? So I put the I put the Genesis thing on the on the table so we can maybe examine that whole notion of image bearing and wonder what it means, right? Um, and so we 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 get a few for. First of all, he says, let, let us make mankind in our image. It's this, a, there's a, it, the, the language goes plural here. Mm -hmm. and I think this is the first time that it, it, it ends up in a, in a sort of plural. Uh, the, the, the grammatical case is a, is a cohortative. It, it's, you know, let us do this together. This is some participative relational way we're going to, we're going to do this act together. Um, and, and, and a little bit later, we get this idea in the image of God, he made male and female, this relational, this relational vision of, 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 of God being relational, human beings being relational too. But the, the immediate one we get after this in our own like in our own likeness, so that they may rule, so that they may rule, it has something to do with the way we exercise God's power and agency in the world. Some connection with that, about this image bearing. That we were created to rule, you know, I don't think that means lord over, right? I think that was a human perversion of this commandment to rule, is to lord over. Uh, and if we, again, connect Son of Man with a suffering servant, you know, uh, the, 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 the Son of Man didn't come, you know, to, to, 
to be served, but to serve. Uh, that somehow this ruler, this ruling comes through service. Human beings are created out of God's generosity. God says, here are the cases of the justice case. Let, 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 let them be. Let them be what they are. And so it was. And he saw that it was good. And to sort of recognizing to the letting be and, and recognizing as good what, what they are. You know, um, something about that, this, this, this giving of oneself generously so the other can be what the other is in goodness. So that the other could, can abide in goodness. You know, so all these living things now become subordinate in some sense with the, the man who is, again, Adam, what, what he, was, he was set in the garden to tend the garden. <clears throat> right? Jerry, are you going to say something? I was just thinking how, how, what Paul did with the... Oh, we lost you. Okay, all I heard of Jerry was, was what, Paul, what Paul did. So I'm going to do what Paul did. I, I'm going to read Paul. So this is 1 Corinthians 15. I don't think this made your notes. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, um, he says, So it is written, the first Adam became a living being, the last Adam a life-giving spirit. So Christ is the last Adam, right? The one who is uh, almost the restoration of Adam, right? Um, the spiritual did not come first, but the natural. And after that, the spiritual. The first man was of the dust of the earth. The second man is of heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth. And as is the heavenly man, so are those who are in heaven. For just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, so we bear the image of the heavenly man. That's uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 49. Just as we've borne the image of the earthly man, so we'll bear the image of... The... Jerry, you're back. We lost you like real quick. You said just as Paul and then I... I don't know what... what uh, can y'all hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I don't know what happened. Uh, the, the, how much does God want us to look like Christ? And just, just, you know, just how much... And I, I think what Paul said to the Ephesians, that he, he said, I pray for you that out of the glorious richness of his resources, that he will strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may actually live in your heart. And then he said, I pray that you'll have the strength and the power along with all Christians to grasp the, the height, the depth, breadth, width of the love of Christ so that you may be filled through your entire being with God himself. Yeah, you think Paul had the concept that we're supposed to have all of this look like Christ. Yeah, yeah, because to the extent that we're loving, yeah. we're like God, right? Yeah. Because yeah. God is love. Understanding right. Christ's love is what's going to give us the power to, to, to have God in us. Yeah, absolutely, Jerry. That's wonderful. Uh, Sanford? Yeah, uh, in the text from Genesis 1, it says... God said that we should, human beings should rule over, but really in the old RSV, uh, it was have dominion over. Yeah. And um, we've misunderstood in our fallen humanity what dominion really means. And then Jesus, as he appeared to his disciples at the end of Matthew said, all authority on, in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Well, that sounds suspiciously like dominion. Yeah, and, no how, question. and the question is, how did Jesus exercise dominion? He spread his arms and he submitted to death on a cross for all humankind and for the whole world. That's how Jesus exhibited dominion. And I think it's more important to know how Jesus exhibited it than how Saddam Hussein may have exhibited in Iraq, where he could do anything he wanted to, yeah, exactly. to anything or anybody. And a lesson for us to learn. 
No, there's no question about it, right? That, that there's something about our image bearing that, went, that goes awry. Yes. We're, we're now human beings rule over, you know, lord over others. Right. And others are to serve their lords, right? And, and it's, uh, you know, I just think the words of Jesus, it's not so with you, you know? Um, yeah. and, uh, and, and, and that's right. We've missed, we've missed. And I, I, I think, I think those scriptures in Genesis were so mangled about what that meant because we, 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 we didn't have a Christ-like God in mind. And that's our problem. We, unless, unless we have a Christ-like God, uh, we're going to have the wrong, we're going to have a very humanly warped notion of what a God is. You know, we would rather God in heaven to be like a human king, a, a human tyrant, uh, than like Christ, um, especially when we're put in the position where we're called to have dominion, and all of us in uh, all of us have dominion over aspects right of our of our lives and our circumstances. Um, yeah, uh, 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 Romans five. Uh, this is interesting. I'm going to wrap it up here soon. He says. Um, Therefore, just as sin entered the world, world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way, death came to all people because all sin. Um, so, you know, this is, this is the, the Adam idea. Um, he says, but the gift is not like the trespass, and if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of one man, Jesus Christ, overflow into the many? A little bit later, verse 18, he says, Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in the condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. For just as through the disobedience of one man the many were made sinners, so through the obedience of the one man the many will be made righteous. Uh, and again, it, uh, I think, Jerry, I think it was you, you're bringing that second Philippians thing, you know, let this mind be in you. It's, um, you know, we became obedient to death, even death on a cross. So here there's the connections that Paul's making, again, without using the terms, between um, the son of man, the, the, the bar, Adam, bar Adam, the son of Adam, and the suffering servant of Yahweh about the one who gives his life as a ransom for many. Right. So I've, I've got one more, I've got one more scripture to, to, to go through. And it's one we read a few weeks ago, but we'll read again in this new light. And this is Mark chapter 10. Um, I don't think this showed up in your notes, but it may have. Um, I don't know what version of the notes I sent out, unfortunately. I, I didn't say when I sent it. He says, uh, this is where James and John, sons of Zebedee, come to him. Um, and they say, teacher, we want you to do for us whatever you ask. And what do you want me to do, they ask. Let us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. He says, you don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Again, in his glory, I think that they're associating the glory with this eschatological, the son of man who's sitting on a throne, you know, basically just judging over all nations, right? That's where they want to be. He says, can you, drink the, can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptized I am baptized with? And of course, we know that baptism refers to his crucifixion. We can, they answer. And Jesus says, you, you will drink the cup I will drink and be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they've been prepared. When the 10 heard about this, uh, about this story of John and James going to Jesus and asking for the privileged places, they became indignant. And I think they came indignant, not because they missed, m misunderstood what he meant. They gave me didn't. Wait, we, we want the first play. That's not for you, right? We don't want you lording over us. Uh, Jesus called them together and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. 
and their high priests exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for men. And it's like, you want to be at the right and the left? Who has been prepared for? For those who are obedient. For those who are obedient to this notion of a God as, as a, a, a son of man who's going to rule with that kind of uh, dominion you're talking about. But what does that look like? It looks like service. It looks like dying in a cross. It looks like love. Okay. That's what dominion looks like from the perspective of God. And so the, I, I really believe this in my heart of hearts, that the people on earth who exercise genuine dominion, who are really ruling the earth, are unrecognized by the powers of the world. <laughs> because it's, it's, it's too humble. It, 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 it doesn't look of the right kind. It's not glorious in human terms. But I believe that they're ruling the world. That's, I think it's why we still have a world in some sense. <laughs> it's because, because this, the remnant, we might call them, you know, of the obedient. Uh, those, who are, uh, those, who are, those who are of Christ. Um, anyway, any other questions about that? It's such a wonderful, I, I was telling Sanford before, I, in some sense I, pick too many scriptures because you can't do too much. And I didn't pick enough because there's almost word, not words enough to deal with this and connect all these, all these things together, thread them to, to, together. It's, it's like a labyrinth trying to tease out all these. Well, you did well. Well, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate yes, it. Yes, you did. Well, all right. Well, let's, uh, Let's close in prayer then, and I thank you again for, for joining us and for all your insightful comments and, and, uh, and for just bearing, bearing with me through this thing. So let's close in prayer. Son of man, we, we pray to you now. Uh, we've heard these words of scripture. We know there are these words that speak about the word, you, and you as the image bearer of God. Lord, exercise dominion over our hearts. Make us image bearers. Help us to go about in our world being forgiving people, being loving people, being people willing to suffer uh, for others, being willing people to serve others. And being pe uh, uh, and people who are unwilling, out of obedience to you, to confuse dominion with domination. Lord, be with us, abide with us, look after our church in these difficult times. Give us images of your authority in the world through your scripture and for through your saints. And be with those who are finding life difficult. And may we exercise the kind of image bearing that they need in this moment. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Woody. Thanks, Woody.